the first American blimps had served in the Great War. Afterwards, the non-rigids took a back seat to the giant rigid airships used as fleet scout. But the world's great powers lost several expensive rigid airships. The War Department had used Army blimps for coastal patrol, but then the funds to modernize the Army airship fleet were denied. So the Army contributed its equipment to the one remaining Navy airship base. The Navy had also bought the old Goodyear Defender and called it G-1. It was 1939 before the Navy tested the new Goodyear 404,000 cubic foot K-2, but the Navy had only trained about 40 LTA officers in the previous decade. Inexperienced crews punctured the big blimp in Lakehurst Piney Woods surrounding the base. By the time K-2 was reinflated, Europe was at war. Pamphlet demonstrating how a few rigid airships could patrol vast sea frontiers was released late in 1941. But the airship Macon, whose scout planes could have detected the Japanese attackers a thousand miles from Pearl Harbor, had been lying on the ocean bottom for six years. The Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company's advertising fleet barnstormed Depression-era America and were familiar sights over cities and county fairs. But war clouds were billowing. The isolation was not to last. America would soon need all her sons who could learn to utilize nature's gift of helium because the blimp would be going to war again. The application of buoyant flight for the U.S. military purposes had by 1937 shrunk to a handful of Navy officers and men based at Lakehurst, New Jersey. Only about nine Navy officers had been blimp qualified in each year since the armistice operating the old J-4, the fuel gas powered K-1, the ZMC-2, and Goodyear's G-1. When the Army was denied further LTA funding, the entire inventory of U.S. Army airships was transferred to the Navy. The proud history of Army LTA quickly faded into obscurity. Only the early 30s blimps, TC-13 and 14, were inflated as Navy airships. Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company had perfected a 123,000 cubic foot blimp design and had built several examples in the 1930s. The Navy ordered one copy, designating it L-1 in April of 1938. L-1 tested its sea refueling and even sky blue camouflage coloring. Beginning in 1935, Navy Master Airship conceptual artist C.P. Burgess called for an experimental airship to the old K-1, so-called K-2. Goodyear's H.R. Liebert led the non-rigid design team to fill in the details of the new large patrol airship. The final car design returned to the old Zeppelin style of command pilot directing the rudderman and the elevatorman and team specialists. 
The 404,000 cubic foot K2 was delivered late in 1938 with a payload capacity of almost three tons. The new airship was the first Navy non-rigid designed for helium. American helium had been promised to safely lift Zeppelin passengers after hydrogen had been blamed for the Hindenburg fire. When Hitler marched into Austria, the helium was quarantined in the port of Galveston. Just before Hitler invaded Poland in September of 1939, the Graf Zeppelin II performed one last military service, sampling British radar transmissions using the World War I spy basket. The LZ-130 was harassed in Scottish territory by British planes. The peaceful luxury liners had no future as Hitler's armies overran Poland. Hated by Reich Minister for Air, Goering, the Graf Zeppelins were dismantled and their hangars demolished. The world's only remaining rigid airship was considered too old for service. In the way, the ZR-3 was dismembered. Scrapping the USS Los Angeles delayed any hope of sky ships operating with the fleet. Some officers pushed to utilize what they could get. Former skipper of Ridges, Captain Charles Rosendahl, published an influential article praising the blimps of World War I. Finally, as part of the 10,000 plane program in 1940, Congress authorized no more than 48 non-rigids. Lakehurst became part of war planning. Practicing with Submarine Squadron II, Lakehurst officers pounded out the first anti-submarine tactical manual as President Roosevelt's Lend-Lease Plan gave England 50 destroyers in exchange for use of land in British colonies. Roosevelt wrote that the blip situation amused him, since the Navy was now working for the small airships he favored all along. The Navy organized neutrality patrols to look for potential belligerents. The old J-4 ultimate evolution of the Great War would finally retire in 1940 after 18 years of service. It was the last Navy airship capable of alighting on the water. The unique old ZMC-2 was dismantled for use as a training aid. Hybrid K-1 was moored out. It was decided to purchase Goodyear's Ranger, another L-type, and build four new copies of the 1937 K-2. But when Germany, Italy, and Japan signed the Tripartite Treaty, the U.S. Navy had only five blimps. Goodyear's Ranger put on the L-2 designation only to have inexperienced crews puncture it in Lake Hurst Pines. It took months to reinflate the L-2 and more time to deliver L-3. Navy Secretary Frank Knox drew up new basic plans which called for new airship bases near Cape Hatteras, in South Florida, at Los Angeles, and Puget Sound. Sunnyvale was to be reclaimed from the Army, and the old Cape May base would be reactivated. But Cape May's World War I hybrid hangar was so badly corroded, it had to be dismantled. $12 million was allocated to establish two eastern locations. Construction began at South Weymouth, Massachusetts and Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Each would receive a shortened steel replica of Akron's famous air dock. Concrete foundations were followed by 2,000 tons of steel arches 190 feet high. The distinctive slipstream clamshell doors were also duplicated. The nation's only airship manufacturers started making four new K-type airships. The World War I hangar at Wingfoot Lake was employed as Goodyear hoped the Navy might exercise its option for two more K-type airships. The 1936 design's high fuel consumption was addressed with lighter Curtis Wright 424 horsepower engines equipped with gearboxes. To keep the unit cost down to $325,000, there were few changes made from K2 besides more helium for greater lift. The new K3 arrived at Lakehurst in September 1941 as the Nazi U-2642 attacked the USS Greer. After 11 sailors were killed when the USS Kearney was torpedoed, sister ship K4 and K5 followed. On Halloween, Nazi torpedoes ripped into the USS Reuben James. 
These bold attacks on neutrality patrols revealed the vulnerability of even high-speed surface craft designated to fight submarines. The Navy ordered 21 more copies of the available K-ship design. Isolation seemed impossible. President Roosevelt warned the Nazis we would start shooting back to protect shipping in our territorial waters. Yet, on December 7, 1941, the attack came from behind. History's most infamous attack was possible because the Japanese task force was able to approach undetected within 200 miles of Pearl Harbor. Nearby, Iwa's mooring mass was still waiting for its long-range scout airship when bombs fell around it. Two dozen submarines encircled Oahu. Summary dismissal of local commanders, Admiral Kimmel and General Short, there was no question of buoyant flight in the western frontier. Not even one barrage balloon, long since proven in Europe, protected our battleships at Pearl. December 19th, a Japanese submarine brought the war to America's doorstep by torpedoing the tanker SS Emilio off Eureka, California. On the 23rd, the SS Montebello was sunk off of San Simeon. Suddenly, the West Coast was the front line. Another ship was attacked off Oregon. Shortly, the I-17 would launch its plane against Los Angeles and shell an oil refinery near Goleta. Operating from her little hangar, Goodyear's advertising ship Resolute began patrolling Los Angeles Harbor like a privateer, armed only with pilot Art Sewell's hunting rifle. The ship was repainted as L-4. Her crew, including R.H. Hobensack, were quickly enlisted in the Navy and sent back out on patrol. The Navy commandeered Goodyear's Enterprise to become L-5. Reliance became L-6 and Rainbow L-7. Serial number NC-10 did not become a replacement ranger as expected. Instead, it was shipped to California to become the L-8. Bomb racks were quickly added and armed patrols began. The little L ships brought comfort to nervous harbors. Sunnyvale became a Navy LTA base again. As the Army pulled everything out, two of their old ships, TC-13 and TC-14, arrived as the only long-endurance airships on the West Coast. This ragtag band formed ZP-32, the West Coast Patrol Squadron. Commanding Officer George Watson established expeditionary bases at coastal Watsonville and Treasure Island to protect San Francisco. Back at Lakehurst, Blimp Patrol Squadron 12 was formed with four 1940 K ships under Lieutenant Commander Raymond Tyler. The veteran L's G1 and K2 remained under station command. Pan's ally, Nazi Germany, had now declared war on America. Suddenly, the United States was involved in a two-front conflict in which no nation had ever been victorious. But no other nation had been blessed with helium. German commander of undersea boats, Admiral Karl Donitz, could muster only five submarines to carry out his plan of attacking shipping along the Northeast American coast. All his campaign a roll on the kettle drums. And what a drum beat it was. January 11th, 1942, a campaign of terror began as the Nazi U-123 torpedoed the steamer Cyclops, 300 miles off Cape Cod. More U-boats arrived in the coming months and to join in the slaughter. In the second period they called the Happy Time, the Nazis torpedoed, shelled, and rammed unescorted ships silhouetted against the brightly lit coastal cities. Searching for the elusive raiders, patrol airships flew hundreds of hours each month. Lakehurst L ships were first armed only with radios to call for support. No U-boats were within range of Lakehurst, and the Nazis were encouraged by the disorganized defenses. The sinkings escalated. The Navy increased its request to the authorized 48 airships, making the K-Type the most mass-produced airship ever. The Bureau of Mines' only helium plant at Amarillo, Texas, was producing 10 million cubic feet per year. 
48 airship strength demanded more lifting gas. Another plant was added to extract the helium-rich natural gas from the vast fields of the Lone Star State. More tank cars were manufactured as America's railroads transported the only practical antidote for gravity. Operational doctrine called for the long endurance airship to find the needle in the haystack, but to attack only after the submarine submerged. If found on the surface, the radio operator would call in for air support or slower surface craft to attack the raider. German intelligence warned their boats by February that Luftschiff's airships would be encountered over certain locations, and in March, a U-boat captain noted an airship in his log. 1916, alarm! Medium-sized airship support. Three death charges at 10 minutes interval. Six, but no damage. Made up at high speed for Bebo water. Under ideal conditions, a submarine could be seen in 60 feet of water. 2035 hours. While scanning the horizon, I discovered an airship on the port beam flying a zigzag course. Because of the clear blue water, I did not like the airship, which would soon be over me. I turned tail and went to deeper water to lie on the bottom. The easily spotted blimps caused the Nazis to be more concerned with their own survival. 1858 hours, alarm, airship, crash dived while airship turned toward me. The merchant marine came to appreciate having airships around. This vessel was attacked while under Corvette and destroyed us for but never under blimp protection. Only then that Goodyear engineers delivered K-7, first with 50 caliber machine gun turret installed. If the airships were going to be more than just guard dogs, more than just eyeballs alone, we needed to find submerged subs under everyday conditions. Veteran K-2 had carried light sensing equipment to develop coastal blackout procedures. Now the super secret Operation SAIL program used K-2 to help adapt detectors derived from the drilling and mining industry. Sensing a distortion in the Earth's field caused by submerged object, magnetic anomaly detection, or MAD gear, showed promise. The sensor was mounted on the hull forward of the car, and the chart recorder gave a readout by the navigator's table. MAD was effective if a low-flying airship passed directly over a submarine. If the scrolling chart showed a signature, a smoke bomb was dropped and another pass was made to determine if the object was moving. But early mad gear hastily added to K-ships was erratic and unreliable, finding more shipwrecks than subs. Meanwhile, off Oregon, a Japanese submarine shelled Fort Stevens, the first fire on a coastal fort since 1812. Down the coast, B-25 bombers were crammed onto a Navy carrier as the first mission against Japan's home island departed the Golden Gate. Patrol blimp L-8 became a cargo ship as former Goodyear pilot John Riker delivered vital bomber parts to the crowded deck of the USS Hornet. Jimmy Doolittle's raiders went on to boost American morale with the daring 30 seconds over Tokyo. To obscure the airship's capabilities, designation letters and numbers were blotted out. Orders also came to paint out the tricolor stripes on the blimp's tail surface. On the foggy San Francisco morning of August 16, L-8 pilot Lieutenant Ernest Cody noted his wet airship was heavy. To compensate, mechanic J. Riley Hill was given the day off. Unfortunately for Cody and co-pilot Ensign Charles Adams, no mechanic tending the leaned engines may have caused carbon fouling. Both men may have lost their lives hanging outside trying to start the hot, stalled engines. Minus the crew's weight, L-8 rose past pressure height and blew helium through the safety valves. The hull lost its rigidity. Drifting home alone as a free balloon, it snagged on a telephone pole in Daly City. Well-meaning rescuers ripped the bag and found no one aboard. The equipment was intact and fuel remained. L-8 was given a new envelope and quietly returned to service. But the mystery of what happened to her vanished crew has become legend. Back in the Atlantic, 
U-boat's carnage continued as the Nazis capitalized on inadequate cooperation between Army, Navy, and Merchant Marine. Some nations put U.S. ports off limits for their ship. Armament was doubled as external bomb racks were fitted to the new K-ships, ships but the tanker Persephone was sunk even though patrolling blimp K-4 was a few miles away. Criticized for their lack of coordination, department officials were compelled to accept the proven British convoy techniques. Merchantmen would be grouped in rows of five or less to present fewer flank targets. Many of the long endurance airships would change their mission from patrol to escort, following shipping south to North Carolina and north to Massachusetts. The incomplete bases near Elizabeth City and South Weymouth could be utilized from Lakehurst so crews could follow a convoy going in either direction. With their steel hangars well underway, each of the new bases commissioned one squadron. ZP-14 formed at the North Carolina base, now named Weeksville. Likewise, ZP-11 at South Weymouth, Massachusetts, featured one blimp on loan from Lakehurst. The three light squadrons formed the first airship patrol group, commanded by Captain George H. Mills. The new interlocking plan had the airships take on the role of shepherd of the convoys, trying to ward off U-boats and keep merchant ships in line. Blimps helped merchantmen make safer rendezvous some 50 miles from port. Some old ships had no radios and had to be herded in line with flashing light signals alone. Often the airship's command pilot was designated SOPA, meaning senior officer present afloat but there were too few airships and too much ocean. The situation was beyond grim as two or three ships were being sunk every day. Bodies washed ashore as helpless civilians watched the attacks from oil-stained beaches.